Hello, family and friends. It's days 107 and 108. So we are all caught up with these two lessons that we will be reading today. So on track again to finish reading through the Bible in 365, which I know some people are excited about. Some people are like, we don't care how long it takes us. Some people are saying this is way too fast for me. But regardless, it is our goal to finish in 365 without missing anything along the way. We definitely don't want to try to rush through this at all. But if you're new here, welcome to Bible study. My name is Kanoi, and we are studying currently in 1 Samuel chapters 25 through 27. And then we are going to hit up some of the Psalms that David penned that surrounded this time period as well. And the best thing is, is that when he pens these Psalms, it helps to fortify our faith because David had such big trust. He also had moments of backsliding and we'll see that as well. But before we get started, if you could help us out by liking this video, giving it a thumbs up if these Bible studies have blessed your life in any way. Make sure you're connected with us in our Facebook group. We've got an amazing community over there and there are people on all different levels. They are on all different days in the Bible study. Some people I don't even think are watching the videos and it is all good. It is just a family that is coming together to support each other in our relationship with Christ. And also please let this be an active conversation. If you have questions, put them in the comments below. Or if you just have commentary, please give us your mana'o, which is in Hawaiian, your wisdom, or we will all be grateful for it. So dear Heavenly Father, who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread as we read your word, Lord, help it to come to life. Let us be recipients of it. Open our eyes, clear out all the junk that might be in our minds or in our hearts, in our ears, in our eyes. Clear it all away, Lord, so that we can see you, hear you, and receive your word clearly today. Forgive us, Lord, of our sins as we forgive those who have hurt us, who have sinned against us, who have thrown spears at us. Thank you, Lord, that we are able to forgive them because we have been forgiven by you. Help us to be reminded of that every day. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, from any attacks of the enemy. Lord, I know a lot of people are feeling like they're getting attacked right now. I pray that you will make them resist so that the enemy will have to flee. Lord, I know that there is sickness that is coming down on a lot of people. Lord, we rebuke the enemy in what he is trying to do. And I pray for healing right now upon the bodies of those who are suffering. Lord, I particularly want to lift up my friend Max, my friend Rhonda, my friend Rebecca. Lord, those are just people you've placed on my heart right now. There are so many others who are in need. I pray right now that those who are praying with us will just speak the name out loud, speak the names of the people who we know that need healing, that need your touch upon their lives. And we say their names in faith and believe, Lord, that you will have a healing touch on their body. But most of all, Lord, we pray that your will be done because we know that it is the best thing for our lives, Lord, whatever it is that you have planned for us. We love you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. So here we start off chapter 25 with the death of Samuel. Now Samuel, this is a good timing for him to leave the scene as Saul has just declared that he knows that David is the rightful king and he is recognizing that. So here in for verse one, now Samuel died and all Israel assembled and mourned for him and they buried him in his house at Ramah. So the fact that all of Israel came and the fact that they came to Ramah just goes to show how well respected and popular Samuel was. And they all came to him. And of course, we will see him later on in uh, Hebrews 11 in the hall of faith. He becomes a hero of faith. Then David rose and went down to the wilderness of Paran. And there was a man in Maon, which is about eight miles south of Hebron. It's in the Judean hill country, whose business was in Carmel. The man was very rich, and he had 3,000 sheep and 1,000 goats. He was shearing his sheep in Carmel. And so the time of shearing the sheep was similar to the time of a harvest. There would have been a big festival. Um, it was a big occasion. Verse 3, now the name of the man was Nabal. So Nabal actually means fool. And we'll see that this name is quite fitting for him. And the name of his wife, Abigail. Abigail means my father is rejoicing. The woman was discerning, or otherwise she was wise and beautiful. But the man was harsh and badly behaved. So quite the contrast here between husband and wife. He was a Calebite. 
And David heard in the wilderness that Nabal was shearing his sheep. So David sent 10 young men and David said to the young men, go up to Carmel and go to Nabal and greet him in my name. And thus you shall greet him. Peace be to you and peace be to your house and peace be to all that you have. So he wants them to go to him in humility, basically saying, I come in peace. I hear that you have shearers. Now, your shepherds have been with us and we did them no harm and they missed nothing all the time that they were in Carmel. So they are declaring here that we were watching over your flock. You know, we were your protection. And so basically they are here to collect payment because they know that during this time of shearing the sheep, this was generally when people were more generous. It was during the feasts and they were more hospitable. Now, the reason why they were protecting his flock is because during this time, um, they were subject to thieves because not only uh, the flock, but also all of the money that they would be collecting while shearing the sheep and selling it off. And so they're basically giving them an itemized receipt. This is everything that we've done for you. So ask your young men and they will tell you, therefore, let my young men find favor in your eyes for we come on a feast day. Please give whatever you have at hand to your servants and to your son, David. So it's pretty obvious that they had never set a price for the fact that they were acting as security for his flock. But look what he says. When David's young men came, they said all this to Nabal in the name of David, and then they waited. And Nabal answered David's servants, who's David? So he knows what he's doing here because everyone knows David. And he says, who is the son of Jesse? There are many servants these days who are breaking away from their masters. So he's basically calling David a servant. He's adding insult to injury by saying he didn't know who he was, but also now saying, well, there's a lot of servants out there. Why would I know who he is? Shall I take my bread and my water and my meat that I have killed for my shearers and give it to men who come from I do not know where? So he's basically saying, this is all mine. Why would I give it away? So David's young men turned away and came back and told him all this. And David said to his men, every man strap on his sword and every man of them strapped on his sword. And David also strapped on his sword and all about 400 men went up after David while 200 remained with baggage. So David hears the insult. He receives it and he's like, regulators mount up. We're about to throw down right here. But the sad thing is, is that he was faced with this very situation with Saul. When Saul was coming at him, he reacted so differently because the magnitude of the situation was so much greater. A lot of the times we can beat the enemy in the big things, but where we might fail, is when it comes down to the smaller trials, the smaller temptations, which is the very thing that we are seeing with David as he becomes more and more vulnerable and we start to see cracks in his character and the way that he treats those who are below him. Verse 14, but one of the young men told Abigail, Nabal's wife, behold, David sent messengers out of the wilderness to greet our master and he railed at them. Yet the men were very good to us and we suffered no harm and we did not miss anything when we were in the fields as long as we went with them. So they're basically taking up for David here saying, you know what? They actually were really good to us. They were a wall to us both by day and by night, all while the while, while we were uh, with them keeping the sheep. Now, therefore, know this and consider what you should do for harm is determined against our master and against all his house. And he's such a worthless man that one cannot speak to him. So they know that they cannot go to Nabal over this. So they that is why they went to Abigail, basically saying, these guys were good to us, and they're about to take off your husband's head. So they're, they do care about their master, but they know that they cannot tell him this, or he won't receive it. So Abigail made haste. She took 200 loaves and two skins of wine and five sheep already prepared and five seas of parched grain and a hundred clusters of raisins, 200 cakes of figs, and laid them on the donkeys. This just goes to show how rich they were, the fact that she could gather all of that up. I mean, we would all have to go to Costco before we could get any of this, right? She had it within her kingdom. And she said to her young men, go on before me. Behold, I come after you. So she's sending them before her, knowing that she better get something to these men. She better uh, get some kind of news to them and be hospitable to them, bring them a present. But she did not tell her husband Nabal. 
So some would say, well, that's dishonorable for her not to have told her husband. Perhaps it was, but she probably knew that he would not receive it. He wouldn't allow her to go. And as she rode on the donkey and came down under cover of the mountain, behold, David and his men came down toward her and she met them. Now, David had said, Surely in vain have I guarded all that this fellow has in the wilderness so that nothing was missed of all that belonged to him and he has returned me evil for good. So he thinks that by seeing these men coming and seeing Abigail that this is uh, Nabal's people coming after him. God do so to the enemies of David and more also if by morning I leave so much as one male of all who belong to him. So he's like, I'm about to take these guys out. So he's calling down the judgment of God upon these people. Now, when Abigail saw David, she hurried and got down from the donkey and fell before David on her face and bowed to the ground. So this is showing humility. She fell at his feet and said, on me alone, my Lord, be the guilt. So she is claiming the guilt, even though really she had nothing to do with it. Please let your servant speak in your ears. So she is asking him to listen to her and hear the words of your servant. Let not my Lord regard this worthless fellow Nabal. So she actually calls her husband worthless fellow, literally meaning the sons of Belial, like the son of Satan, basically. So again, another thing perhaps she shouldn't have done. I mean, even though we may think things of our spouse that may be, uh, you know, not pleasing, we probably shouldn't be talking to others about them because it doesn't help the situation anyway. So some people say that that probably wasn't good, but we know that when we take a bird's eye look at this, that her not telling Nabal and her telling this to David actually got her to be on the side of David. It got him to kind of probably put down his defenses. So for those who are saying she's sinning here, I don't know. I'm just like, listen, this, this was God's purpose, <laughs> even though we can't justify her doing that. But anyway, let's continue. For as his name is, so is he. So she is saying he's a fool. Nabal is his name and follies with, uh, is with him. But I, your servant, did not see the young men of my Lord whom you sent. She's like basically saying, I, I technically should have been hospitable to them, but I'm so sorry I didn't see them. Now then, my Lord, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, because the Lord has restrained you from the blood guilt and from saving with your own hand, now then let your enemies and those who seek to do evil to my Lord be as Nabal. And now let this present that your servant has brought to my Lord be given to the young men who follow my Lord. So she knows that she needs to give this present uh, as a means of kind of like a peace offering, but she's wise in not giving it to David because if she gave it to David, it would have almost looked like she was trying to pay him off. But instead she presents it to his servants. Please forgive the trespasses of your servant. So she is just straight up asking for forgiveness. For the Lord will certainly make my Lord a sure house because my Lord is fighting the battles of the Lord and evil shall not be found in you. So as long as you live. So she does care I think, about the future of David. If men rise up to pursue you and seek your life, the life of my Lord shall be bound in the bundle of the living in the care of the Lord your God. And the lives of your enemies he shall sling out as from the hollow of a sling. So the fact that she's referring to this, she's letting him know that she is aware of his past. She knows what he did to Goliath and she is trying to appeal to that. So when she says he shall sling out as from the hollow of a sling, she's basically saying, God, let God reject them. And when the Lord has done to my Lord, according to all the good that he had spoken concerning you and has appointed you prince over Israel, my Lord shall have no cause of grief or pangs of conscience for having shed blood without cause or for my Lord working salvation himself. And when the Lord has dealt with my Lord, dealt well with my Lord, then remember your servant. Okay, so this is a little bit controversial here because one, she's saying, listen, I know who you are. I know what you've done. Don't do this because if you do, you, this is going to be on your conscience forever. This blood is going to be on your hands and there's really nothing that compares to the fact that you are anointed king. You are the one who is rightful to be on the, th on the throne. So don't throw it all away. And it's interesting that when she says, remember your servant, it looks like she may have been uh, kind of proposing herself to him like, hey, you know, when my husband dies, don't forget about me. That's what some commentaries say anyway. 
So she wants him to consider the outcome and not do anything he'll regret. Verse 32, and David said to Abigail, blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, who sent you this day to meet me. So he knows that God is in control here and that he is doing something that is bigger than he could have ever done. Blessed be your discretion and blessed be you. You have kept me this day from blood guilt because he would have been marked had he killed Nabal and from working salvation with my own hand. For as surely as the Lord, the God of Israel lives, who has restrained me from hurting you, unless you had hurried and come to meet me truly by morning, there had not been left to Nabal so much as one male. So he's like, I would have killed you. Then David received from her hand what she had brought to him. And he said to her, go up in peace to your house. See, I have obeyed your voice and I have granted your position. So it's kind of funny here because in the beginning I was, uh, I forget, oh here, I was like, hashtag be like Abigail because when they speak of her as being a beautiful woman, the only other women spoken of that way was Rachel and Esther, who are also amazing women, right? So it's like, yeah, be like Abigail. And then over here, I was like, e, don't be like her. <laughs> don't offer yourself to men while you're married, thinking about the fact that they're going to die. But anyway, the lesson learned here is insults don't justify disobedience. So when people come at you, it doesn't give you a pass to then go and act with vengeance. It doesn't give you a pass to sin, to act out in anger, and to be insulting right back. So hopefully David learned this lesson here. Verse 36, and Abigail came to Nabal and behold, he was holding a feast in his house like the feast of a king. So he's pretty clueless here. And Nabal's heart was merry within him for he was drunk. So he told nothing or she told him nothing at all until the morning light. When he sobered up in the morning, when the wine had gone out of Nabal, his wife told him these things and his heart died within him. So he didn't die, but his heart died and he became as a stone. So some scholars say that he may have had a stroke. Somehow he got paralyzed. I don't know if it's a heart attack, whatever it was. He was still alive, but incapacitated. Verse 38, and about 10 days later, the Lord struck Nabal and he died. So this was perhaps God's judgment on Nabal. And when David heard that Nabal was dead, he said, blessed be the Lord who has avenged the insult I received at the hand of Nabal and has kept back his servant from wrongdoing. So remember when God said, vengeance is mine and I will repay them in Deuteronomy 32. He remembers this. David knows this, that God is the avenger and he knows and recognizes that God kept him from doing the wrong thing. What mercy, right? That God had on him. Then David sent and spoke to Abigail to take her as his wife. So perhaps he remembered that proposition that she gave to him, or maybe he just thought, you know what? She was good to me and she's still out there. She needs a husband. So let's, let's go get her as a wife. Uh, when the servants of David came to Abigail at Carmel, they said to her, David has sent us to you to take you to him as his wife. And she rose and bowed with her face to the ground and said, behold, your handmaid is a servant to wash the feet of the servants, my Lord. So she is willing to take on this menial task that was set aside for servants, which is showing her humility, but also the fact that she is grateful. This is gratitude to wash the feet of these servants. And Abigail hurried and rose and mounted a donkey and her five young women attended her. She followed the messengers of David and became his wife. So some people would say, oh, but this is polygamy. Well, technically, remember, Michael was given to, no, was that Michael? Well, regardless, he's no longer with Michael. Um, so this is kind of like his second first wife, if that makes any sense. But verse 43, now we see polygamy. David also took Ahinoam of Jezreel and both of them became his wives. Saul had given Michael his daughter, there it is, David's wife to Paltai, Pal Palti, I don't know, the son of Laish, who was of Galam. Um, now, polygamy wasn't, it wasn't uh, strictly forbidden at least not yet, in the sense that God said, you shall not have more than one wife or husband. But we know that polygamy never ends well. And we will see the problems that it causes David, the fact that he has more than one wife. There was so much to learn from Abigail. She was wise. She was beautiful. She had such great countenance. She was humble. And in the end, she did the right thing. She was protecting her husband, even though she knew that he was a fool and she called him one with her very lips. 
But had she not protected him, had she not done the right thing, she would have never become the wife of a king. Chapter 26, then the Ziphites came to Saul at Gibeah saying, is not David hiding himself on the hill of Hakala, which is on the east of Jeshimon? So doesn't this not sound familiar? This is the exact same thing that happened back in chapter 23, where they betrayed him once before. So old habits die hard here. So Saul arose and went down to the wilderness of Ziph with 3,000 chosen men of Israel to seek David in the wilderness of Ziph. So they are about 3,000 men to David's 600 men. So David is very outnumbered here. And Saul encamped on the hill of Hakala, which is beside the road on the east of Jeshimon. But David remained in the wilderness. And this is likely where he penned Psalm 54. When he saw that Saul came after him into the wilderness, David sent out spies and learned that Saul had indeed come. So he was probably hopeful that Saul meant what he said back in chapter 24, uh, that he would not come after him again, but he did. So then David rose and came to the place where Saul had encamped. So he's not going to sit back and let his army fight it. He's like, look, I'm going to command this myself. And David saw the place where Saul lay with Abner, the son of Ner, the commander of his army. Saul was laying within the encampment while the army was encamped around him. So he's laying there with all 3,000 men surrounding him, protecting him. Then David said to Ahimelech, which was probably his mercenary soldier who volunteered service to David. So Ahimelech the Hittite and to Joab's brother, Abishai, the son of Zeruiah, Zeru, I don't know, Zeruiah? <laughs> who will go down with me into the camp to Saul? And Abishai said, I will go down with you. So there he's going. Uh, so David and Abishai went to the army by night and there lay Saul sleeping with the encampment. Sorry, Abishai is David's nephew. I didn't mention that. Uh, and he is volunteering to go down with him. Okay, so David and Abishai went down to the army by night and there lay Saul sleeping within the encampment with his spear his symbol of authority stuck in the ground at his head and Abner and the army lay around him. Then Abishai said to David, God has given your enemy into your hand this day. Please let me pin him to the earth with one of the sh one stroke of the spear and I will not strike him twice. He's like, I will do this in one blow. But look what David says. Mm -mm. Do not destroy him for you can put out his hand against the Lord's anointed and be guiltless. So, Abishai is a little bit of an overzealous friend here. He reminds me of Peter. When Peter's like lopping off the ears of the people who are trying to take Jesus, you know, he's like, Lord, you will not die. So a little bit too much here. And David's like, no, no, no. He is the Lord's anointed. You will have the blood of guilt on your hands if you kill him. And David said, as the Lord lives, the Lord will strike him. So again, he's showing his faith here. Or his day will come to die or he'll go down into the battle and perish. The Lord forbid that I should put out my hand against the Lord's anointed. So he knows that God is going to take care of Saul. But take now the spear that is at his head and the jar of water and let us go. So God gave David a second chance again. Maybe not a second chance. Maybe more like a second opportunity or test to see if he would destroy Saul. But David waited and trusted again in the Lord. So David took the spear and the jar of water from Saul's head and they went away. Now, no man saw it or knew it, nor did any awake, for they were all asleep because a deep sleep from the Lord had fallen upon them. So here we see God's in control here. He made them fall asleep so they would not hear him. I was wondering while I was reading, how come they can't hear this conversation? <laughs> so surely among 3000, there was one light sleeper, but God had intervened here. Verse 13, then David went over to the other side and stood far off on the top of the hill with a great space between them. And David called to the army and to Abner, the son of Ner, saying, will you not answer Abner? Then Abner answered, who are you who calls to the king? And David said to Abner. Now remember, Abner is the commander of his army. So he is not calling to Saul. He's calling to the army and Abner. Are you not a man? So that's kind of an insult right there. Who is like you in Israel? Why then have you not kept watch over your Lord, the king? Again, insulting him for basically saying you failed for one of the people came in to destroy the king, your Lord. This thing that you've done is not good. As the Lord lives, you deserve to die, Abner, because you have not kept watch over your Lord, the Lord's anointed. And now see where the king's spear is and the jar of water that was at his head. Uh oh. So Saul recognized David's voice and said, is this your voice, my son, David? And David said, it is my voice, my Lord, O king. 
still so humble, still so honorable to his father or his uh, father-in-law. And he said, why does my Lord pursue after his servant? For what have I done? So David is like, why are you still doing this? I haven't done anything to you. All right, so let's go back before we miss something here. Uh, John Corson said, I will not tremble in the presence of man if I have trembled in the presence of God. Okay. So I'm not sure exactly how and where that went, but that makes sense. If we're in the presence of God, we won't fear man. That's basically what he was saying. All right. I just want to make sure I didn't miss anything else. When he was speaking to Abner, he basically told him you were negligent and I was righteous. Okay. So that's where we're at. So David is saying, why, what are you doing? Why? What have I done? What evil is on my hands? Now, therefore, let my Lord, the King hear the words of his servant. So please listen to me, Saul. If it is the Lord who has stirred you up against me. So perhaps he's thinking, I don't know, maybe he deserves some discipline and this is a divine discipline on behalf of the Lord. Or maybe he is trying to, again, remember before he was like, why would you listen to your friends? Like he puts it on somebody else so it doesn't seem like a harsh rebuke. So he was like, if it is the Lord who stirred you up against me, may he accept an offering. But if it is men, may they be cursed before the Lord, for they have driven me out this day that I should have no share in the heritage of the Lord saying, go serve other gods. So David was giving Saul the easy way out by putting it on the Lord. And then his biggest concern here is not so much that Saul is after him. His biggest concern is that because he's been driven into the wilderness, he's had nowhere to worship. There have been no sanctuaries outside of Israel where he's been in the wilderness. And so no place for him to worship. And this was his biggest complaint. Interesting. Love that. May we be people like that who are more concerned about worshiping God than anything else in our day. Now, therefore, let me not or let not my blood fall to the earth away from the presence of the Lord. For the king of Israel has come out to seek a single flea like one who hunts a, a partridge in the mountains. And so now we're going to see basically the last meaningful words of Saul. So he says, I have sinned. Return, my son, David, for I will no more do to you harm because my life was precious in your eyes this day. Behold, I have acted foolishly and I've made a great mistake. So before when he acknowledged his sin before David, it seemed a little bit more heartfelt perhaps, but he still was only regretful, not repentant in both cases. Um, and this is almost kind of like his epitaph. I mean, he doesn't realize this, but he's about to die. So these are kind of like his last words. I've sinned. I've, uh, I have uh, done you harm. My life was precious in your eyes, but I've acted foolishly. I've made great mistakes. So a heart check here. If you were to die today, what would be your epitaph? What would be the things, the words that are spoken about you? What would be the words that you would speak of your own life? And would you change anything? And should you change something so that your epitaph at the end of your life is different from the way that it looks today? So David answered and said, here is the spear, O king. Let one of the young men come over and take it. The Lord rewards every man for his righteousness and his faithfulness. For the Lord gave you into my hand today, and I would not put out my hand against the Lord's anointed. So David is declaring the fact that he's doling out righteousness and faithfulness. Um, and it's because of the fact that God has been his righteousness and God has been so faithful to him. So the measure by which you give, it will be given back to you. And he knows this. He knows that if he extends righteousness and faithfulness to other people, that God will return that. So one more heart check here. What are you doling out? What are you giving out to others? so that it could then be returned back to you. So he continues, Behold, as your life was precious this day in my sight, so may my life be precious in the sight of the Lord, and may he deliver me out of all tribulation. This sounds kind of similar to his heart in his, some of his Psalms. Then Saul said to David, Blessed be you, my son David. You will do many things and will succeed in them. I love that. I'm going to write that down. Even though they're the words of Saul, I'm going to take them. <laughs> You will do many things and will succeed in them. I believe that in Jesus' name. So David went his way and Saul returned to his place. So this was the last meeting that we see between Saul and David. And David ends here wanting the throne, but he's not going to do it 
without the blessing of the Lord. Now this seems like a moment of victory for David, but unfortunately it's in this moment where he starts to lose trust in the Lord and he starts to lose some faith. Perhaps it's because he thinks Saul will go back on his word once again. And this just goes to show that discouragement and despair can oftentimes be way more powerful than an actual person coming against you or people who are slandering you. It is the things within your own mind that will start to break you down to the point where you start to go down the wrong road. Chapter 27, then David said in his heart, now I shall perish one day by the hand of Saul. There's nothing better for me than that I should escape to the land of the Philistines. And I'm like, no, David. So he thinks he has no other options but to go live with the Philistines. For I guess he believes that Saul will continue to go after him. Now he has to be careful here because this goes to show that what he's saying in his heart is leading him down the wrong road. This is why we have to be so careful about when we get down, about the things that we mutter to ourselves because our hearts are deceitful and desperately wicked and they will lead us to the wrong conclusions a lot of the time and will ultimately detour because our wicked heart will end up leading us in the wrong direction. So don't talk to your heart. Don't listen to your heart <laughs> because the Bible says, again, that it is deceitful and desperately wicked. Instead, be anxious for nothing and talk to God. Take your prayers to him and then the peace of God will guard your hearts and your minds. Because the thing is, is like what we say in our hearts is going to shape your thinking. You know that it begins in your heart. It begins with a thought. That's why the Bible says to take captive your thoughts. It's going to take shape um, in your thoughts, but also in your actions and also in your destiny. It's, it's all going to spiral and snowball. All right, so he is going to go be with the Philistines. So then Saul will despair of seeking me any longer within the borders of Israel, and I shall escape out of his hand. So he thinks he's going to be able to um, kind of be out of the radar, under the radar of Saul at this point, which he will be. So that's the good thing. But the bad thing is, is he's choosing to do it the wrong way. So David arose and went over. He and 600 men who were with him. And look, he's taken people with him. When you go down the wrong road, you're going to take people with you to Achish, the son of Maok, the king of Gath. So Gath is one of the five Philistine cities. And David lived with Achish at Gath, he and his men, every man with his household, and David with his two wives, Ahinoam of Jezreel and Abigail of Carmel, Nabal's widow. And when it was told Saul that David had fled to Gath, he no longer sought him. So there you go. It did happen. Verse five, then David said to Achish, if I have found favor in your eyes, let a place be given to me in one of the country towns that I may dwell there. So first of all, he's looking for favor in the enemy's eyes. Don't do that. <laughs> Don't look for favor from the enemy. But regardless, for why should your servant dwell in the royal city with you? So that day Achish gave him Ziklag. Now Ziklag was originally given to Judah but they never possessed it, the Israelites. So the enemy is no longer chasing David. And this is exactly what happens whenever you leave the fellowship. Satan will leave you alone if you are no longer in the territory where God is, where his presence lies, where the fellowship of believers is. The enemy will no longer come after you because you're not a threat. And also Ziklag is a fortified city. So even though they live in this fortified city, sadly, David sees that as his protection, but he, we all know that without God and being apart from God, they really don't have that true and real protection. And so that day he gave him Ziklag, therefore Ziklag has belonged to the kings of Judah to this day. So Judah did end up getting it back, God using it for good. And the number of the days that David lived in the country of the Philistines was a year and four months. Now, even though David is technically in enemy territory and he is submitting himself to the Philistines, he actually learns a lot while he's there in this time. God uses it for good as he is trained up militarily, he is trained up in his leadership skills, and he also gets to know the region so that later on when he goes to battle with the Philistines, he is at an advantage. Verse 8, now David and his men went up and made raids against the Geshurites, the Gizurites, the Amalekites, for these were the inhabitants of the land from of old. So these were the people that they were supposed to have driven out, but they didn't. 
as far as sure to the land of Egypt. And David would strike the land and would leave neither man nor woman alive, but would take away the sheep, oxen, donkeys, camels, and the garments and came back to Achish. So sadly here, um, he is, okay, well, the good thing, the good news is, is he is successful, militarily successful. He's active in service, but it doesn't indicate that he is spiritual here because he's actually very backslidden right now. So just like us, you know, being busy is never going to determine your spirituality and your faith. Now, he is killing the men and women because he doesn't want to be found out. He doesn't want to get caught. And so he thinks that the only way to not get caught is to take out all the people, men and women, even though God did not uh, ask him to do this. It just says to drive people out. This was what was supposed to be done a long time ago. Now, this sin, the root of the sin of just murdering people so that he isn't caught or found out, it's going to haunt him later on with Uriah. Whenever he loves Bathsheba, he ends up taking her and the husband Uriah, he ends up murdering him. So the root of sin has got to be dealt with or they will come back with greater strength. Verse 10, and when Achish asked, where have you made your raid today? David would say, oh, against the Negev of Judah or against the Negev of the Jeramielites or against the Negev of the Kenites. So he's basically saying he's going against his own people here. I'm going against all Israel, your enemies, but that's a lie. And David would leave neither man nor woman alive to bring news to Gath thinking lest they should tell us, tell about us and say, so David has done. Such was his custom all the while he lived in the country of the Philistines and Achish trusted David, thinking he has made himself an utter stench to his people Israel. Therefore, he shall always be my servant. So he believes that David is loyal to him. And sadly, during this time, it is believed that no Psalms were written here because David was so far gone. So now we're going to turn over to day 108, starting off with Psalm 117, sorry, 17. This is called In the Shadow of Your Wings. This is the first uh, psalm that we see of David that is actually a prayer. So it's a psalm of lament. It's a protest of innocence. It is declaring his trust in God, his low confidence in himself, and also a glorious heavenly hope. So verse 1 Hear a just cause, O Lord, attend to my cry. So he is pleading for God's vindication in these first couple of verses. Give ear to my prayer from lips free from deceit. Okay, so just a chapter before, we were reading about the fact that he was a straight up liar, but he's declaring here to God that his lips are free from deceit. And we'll continue and I will talk about that in a second. From your presence, let my vindication come. So he doesn't want to take matters into his own hands. He's asking, Lord, please do something. Let your eyes behold the right. You have tried my heart. You have visited me by night. You have tested me and you will find nothing. So a testing of the heart. God knows our needs and what is in our hearts. And this prayer causes or focuses on the source of strength. And it also reaffirms the determination to live a pure life. So he's basically saying, you're going to test me, Lord, and I am going to pass. And he says, I have purposed that my mouth will not transgress. So perhaps this was written before he started lying, or perhaps he understands the grace and forgiveness of God. Um, he knows where he stands with the Lord. He knows that his lying is forgiven and it is washed away. So he is declaring that he is no longer a liar. And that should be the case with us. We are not labeled by the things that we did in our past. People cannot stamp those labels on you if you have repented, truly repented now, and walked away, changed, transformed, redeemed, renewed. So don't let those labels be stamped on you, okay? So do you know where you stand? Do you understand your position as a forgiven child of God? Let's go back to the testing and the trying of the heart. What are some things that we can try our hearts before we go to the Lord in prayer? How can we do this? We can look at ourselves and say, have I been disobedient in any way? Have I been selfish in any way? Have I neglected a need? Is there something I was supposed to do and I haven't done it? Is there a wrong that I need to make right? And are my priorities in order? These are all things that we can test our own hearts on before we are going to say, Lord, change my heart. Show me what I need to do. 
these are things we can look and say, okay, you know what? I, I need to get this right. I can bring this before the Lord. All right, I got I to gotta take care of that. And it doesn't mean you can't go to the Lord without doing this, but this is a really great start so that you know what to pray about because God already knows your heart. He already knows what's going on, but it takes two in this relationship. He can forgive us, but we have got to be willing to acknowledge, to confess and repent. Verse four, with regard to the works of man, by the word of your lips, I have avoided the ways of the violent. So David lives by the word of God. And it's interesting because I saw this quote, this book will keep you from sin or sin will keep you from this book. So this is what's happening here. The word of God is keeping him from the violent, from the ways of the violent, from being wicked. My steps have held fast to your paths, not my own paths, but yours, God. My feet have not slipped. So the road is good, but our feet are evil. And David knows this, and he knows that his feet have not slipped because he's been on the path of God. Verse six, this is going to be a plea for mercy. I call upon you for you will answer me, O God, incline your ear to me. So this is him again, stooping down from heaven to put his ear to his child. Hear my words, wondrously show your steadfast love or your loyal love. O savior of those who seek refuge from their adversaries at your right hand. Keep me as the apple of your eye. Hide me in the shadow of your wings. Now, a lot of the times we talk about the shadow of your wings being like a mother hen, like a bird that goes in under the wings of her mother um, for protection, warmth, and love. But this one may have actually been speaking more about the eagle that jostles the nest of its baby, knocks it out. So that it goes tumbling down and then at the very end, the eagle swoops in, picks the baby up, back up to the nest, only to jostle it again for it to fall out again. So perhaps he sees it like this, like I know that I have been jostled out of the nest, but I understand that you are my protector. The shadow of your wings is above me and I know that you are going to come in and swoop in even if it's in the last moment, but you will do it and you will rescue me. So two different ways of looking at the shadow of the wings and keeping you as the apple of your eye. We've talked about this before, but uh, most of the commentaries that I read speak of the fact that this is talking about how your uh, center of your eye, we have it built in us as humans to blink with in one one or no one ten thousandth of a second, if something is coming toward our eye, so that is how quickly it is illustrating that the Lord will protect His children. We instinctively will blink, just the way that the Lord will instinctively come down and protect His children. So you hide me in the shadow of your wings from the wicked who do me violence, my deadly enemies who surround me. So He is praying in the midst of knowing that. People are attacking him. They close their hearts to pity. So he's saying they are insensitive. Other translations say they have fat hearts. With their mouths, they speak arrogantly. They have now surrounded our steps. They set their eyes to cast us to the ground. He is like a lion eager to tear as a young lion lurking in ambush. So that is the devil himself right there. So this is a description of the wicked in these verses. Then we're going to see a renewed plea for vindication. Arise, O Lord, confront him, subdue him. So he's showing his dependence on God here. Deliver my soul from the wicked by your sword or your word. The fact that it says he lived by the word, he understands that the sword, the true sword of God is God's word, which is where his promises lie. From men by your hand, O Lord, from men of the world whose portion is in this life. So he's saying these guys only care about what is in the now. They only care about what is in this temporary world. They only care about things that will bring them satisfaction here and now, which is basically evil. You fill their womb with treasure. They are satisfied with children and they leave their abundance to their infants. As for me, so he is like, I'm going to compare myself here, contrasting myself to my enemies. I'm very different from them. I shall behold your face in righteousness. So he's saying, I'm going to have this unhindered fellowship with you. When I awake or when I see you, I shall be satisfied with your likeness. So some scholars say this is speaking of af the afterlife, when we awake in heaven 
and they're saying, I shall be satisfied with your likeness goes to show that heaven is more real than we think. A lot of times we think of it as being like this dreamlike, smoky, you know, kind of foggy place. It's so hard for us to grasp the reality of heaven, but they say it's probably going to be a lot more lifelike than we think. It's going to be very much so like we are now. But regardless, this really means that we have the ability to grasp part of eternity now. We can live a life that is more alive, more conformed to the likeness of God. So we can have heaven on earth now. Psalm 35 is called Great is the Lord. This is a psalm of lament. It is a protest of his innocence and an imprecatory psalm, which means the emphasis is on his enemies and what the enemies are doing to him. So again, this is when Saul is out to get him um, while others are gossiping about him. So this is his response to that time, um, probably after he saw Jonathan again. So in 1 Samuel 23. Contend, O Lord, with those who contend with me. Fight against those who fight against me. Take hold of shield and buckler and rise for my help. Draw the spear and, and uh, spear and javelin against my pursuers. So he's not afraid to ask God to physically fight for him because he knows that those who are against him are naturally against God. So he's like, they're against you anyway. So please rise up and fight for them. So he's appealing to God as the warrior that he is to plead his cause. Say to my soul, I am your salvation. It's almost like he needs to hear this. He's like, please remind me that you are my savior, my salvation. I don't need anything else to save me, but you. Verse four, let them be put to shame and dishonor. So he's not talking about shame, like embarrassment, but he's talking about this final judgment, let them be shamed and also be dishonored. Let the tables turn on them who seek after my life. Let them be turned back and disappointed who devise evil against me. So this is a petition against his enemies. Verse five, let them be like chaff before the wind with the angel of the Lord driving them away. So again, the angel of the Lord, could this mean the guardian angel for each person or just an angel of the Lord? Not sure. But he knows, nevertheless, that this is a spiritual battle. He knows that we do not fle- uh, wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the spiritual world. Let their way be dark and slippery with the angel of the Lord pursuing them. For without cause, they hid their net from me. Without cause, they dug a pit for my life. Let destruction come upon him when he does not know it. And let the net that he hid ensnare him. Let him fall into it to his destruction. So again, he's like, please confuse them so that they fall into their own pit. Then my soul will rejoice in the Lord. He's like, I will be happy when you do this. And this is a petition for deliverance here in these next couple of verses. All my bones shall say. So he's like, my innermost being will say, O Lord, who is like you? Nothing compares to you. Delivering the poor from him who is too strong for him. The poor and needy from him who robs him. So this is the first part of his confidence in this psalm. And he is showing how we will often triumph in salvation and not in the destruction of others. It is when we are saved that we will triumph the most, not when other people get destroyed. Malicious witnesses rise up. And sadly, these are people that probably he has helped in the past. They ask me of things that I do not know. They repay me evil for good. Very much so the way that people did to Jesus. My soul is bereft or sorrowful. But I, when they were sick, I wore a sackcloth. I afflicted myself with fasting. I prayed with head bowed on my chest. I went about as though I grieved for my friend or my brother. As one who laments his mother, I bowed down in mourning. So he's saying, I cared for these people. But at my stumbling, they rejoiced and they gathered. They gathered together against me. Wretches whom I didn't know tore at me without ceasing. Like profane mockers at a feast, they gnash at me with their teeth. How long, O Lord, will you look on? So he feels as though God is being passive, like maybe he's not with him. Rescue me from their destruction, my precious life from the lions. I will thank you in the great congregation, in the mighty throng. I will praise you. 
So he is saying, I will make an acknowledgement publicly. I love that David puts an emphasis on public praise. It is so easy for us to go public with our complaints, to go public with things that are happening to us, to go public with our prayers, to post all of those things all over social media. How often do we actually post public praise. Now I know a lot of people struggle with this because we don't want to seem like we are self-indulgent. We don't want to seem like we are showing off. We are trying to keep a humble heart. But if we bring it back to the glory of God, if we glorify God for the things that are going right in the world, the things that are good in the world, then perhaps people's echo chambers might start to change. So let's start doing that. Let's start challenging ourselves to post about the way that God has answered prayers. Start providing an offering of praise as a testimony to what God is doing. Verse 19, let not those rejoice over me who are wrongfully my foes and let not those wink the eye who hate me without cause for they do not speak peace. And this peace he's saying, they don't speak about wholeness. They don't think they don't speak about things as they ought to be. But against those who are quiet in the land, they devise words of deceit. They open wide their mouths against me. They say, aha, aha, our eyes have seen it. Um, some scholars also say that this section here verses 19 through 21 predicts the suffering of Jesus. And I didn't go read this, but this was the verse, the verses that they referred to John 15 verses 23 through 25. If anyone wants to go look it up and maybe give us some insight on that whenever you read it. Verse 22, you have seen, O Lord, be not silent. So he's appealing to Yahweh here. Now I do want to make this uh, distinction here between the two Lords, because he says, O Lord, be not far from me. So notice here, and it may be different in your Bible, but usually when it is all capital letters and written smaller, that is usually referring to Yahweh, when it said Yahweh in the Hebrew text. So that's the covenant name of God. O Lord, when it's a capital L and lowercase, that is when it was Adonai, written in the Hebrew scripts. So some people, I know there were a couple of people who asked me along the way, and I don't remember if I even answered them or not. Um, I think I did. But maybe if somebody's new and has never made that distinction before, or maybe never even noticed it, that is the difference between the two. And Adonai basically means Lord. Awake and rouse yourself for my vindication, for my cause, my God and my Lord. So even though God doesn't sleep, it's almost like David thinks he's like taking a nap or something. Or he's, again, being passive. Like, get up, Lord. Vindicate me, O Lord, my God, according to your righteousness. So when he says, O Lord, my God, he's referring to Elohim here. And according to your righteousness, not his own. And let them not rejoice over me. Let them not say in their hearts, aha, our hearts desire. Let them not say we have swallowed him up. Let them be put to shame and disappointed altogether who rejoice at my calamity. Let them be clothed with shame and dishonor who magnify themselves against me. Let those who delight in my righteousness shout for joy and be glad and say evermore. Well, that took a turn. So, okay, he has defenders. I feel like this is the first time we have seen that in a psalm. Those who are for me, this is what we can do. Shout for joy, be glad, say evermore. Great is the Lord who delights in the welfare of his servant. And then... My tongue shall tell of your righteousness and of all of your praise all the day long. So he talked a whole lot about his enemies and asking the Lord to vindicate, asking the Lord for vengeance. But at the end here, of course, he ends with gladness, with joy, with declaring that God is great. Psalm 54 is called The Lord Upholds My Life, written after 1 Samuel 26, most likely. This is a psalm of lament. And written to the choir master, so to be sung in the congregation with stringed instruments. So this is the first we are seeing of a very specific way to do it. You do this with stringed instruments. And so this is when the Ziphites went and told Saul, is not David hiding among us? Which we just read. Verse 1, we will see him call for help in the midst of his persecution. Oh God, save me by your name. Meaning by the nature, by your character all of those things, please save me because that is the way that you are and vindicate me by your might, by your power. Oh God, hear my prayer. Give ear to the words of my mouth. 
So again, bend down to me and listen to what I have to say. For strangers have risen against me. Ruthless men seek my life. They do not set God before themselves. Well, if they did, they wouldn't be after him, right? So he is appealing to the fact that, Lord, they are not for you. Please. Behold, God is my helper. He is my power. The Lord is the upholder of my life, or Adonai. So he's declaring here that God is the one who helps him. He will return the evil to my enemies in your faithfulness. Put an end to them. Verse 6, with a free will offering, I will sacrifice to you. I will give thanks to your name, O Lord, for it is good. For he has delivered me from every trouble and my eye has looked in triumph on my enemies. So the fact that this goes to past tense shows that somewhere in the middle of this psalm, his prayer was answered, that God delivered him and he is giving a vow of praise. But another school of thought is that David is simply laying hold to the promise as if it was already done. So they say faith isn't blind. It actually will see more and faith will see the glory of the future in the midst of the gloom of the present. Psalm 63 titled my soul thirsts for you. It's a Psalm of David when he was in the wilderness of Judah. This is a Royal Psalm. And for a while it was read every day by the early church. Okay, first one, oh God. So this he is uh, saying, Elohim, you are my God. Earnestly, I seek you. Some translations say, I seek you early. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. So he was probably in a very dry place spiritually. I don't know if you've ever been there, but I sure have. When my soul was so thirsty and maybe you don't even know what your soul is thirsting for, but in the end, most will not realize that the very thing that they actually need and they actually are craving is God himself. It isn't the thing that they think they're craving. It's heaven. It is the eternal reward. It is God. Now, seeking God early, even though this isn't speaking of time, like we don't have to wake up when the sun rises and be people who are in our word in prayer, but it's kind of recommended because if you think about it, whatever, and okay, and also I know that some people have schedules that are flipped around, like your morning is actually midnight because maybe you work a midnight shift or something like that. So morning, it basically, it's when you arise. Now, what lays hold of your heart in the beginning of your day, so I said morning, but beginning of your day, will be what sustains you or drains you or drains your soul throughout the day. So that was just something that I wrote down uh, as I was reading. And it is so true. I mean, if you armor yourself up with the word of God throughout the day, you will have a um, basically like a supply that even if people drain you or situations drain you, at least you had a reserve. But if you wake up with nothing, you will be depleted at the end of the day. Like you will be in bankruptcy. Your spirit will. So let's continue here. So I have looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and your glory. So in the sanctuary, this is like the high point. And I wrote here, remember the moments of the mountaintop so you can remember in the valley, the goodness and the power and the glory of God. And that is what David is doing here. So this is a search for a renewed sense of God's presence. And then we're going to see a confession of his faith and confidence in God here. Because your steadfast love is better than life. Yes, it is. His love is better than anything here on this earth. My lips will praise you. So even though he's in a dry season, he is declaring that he will praise God. And it is in the times when you are the most dry, when you don't want to pray. That is when you should pray all the more. Double time, double up on your prayer, double up on your praise. It's when you don't feel like it is when you really should do it out of obedience. So I will bless you as long as I live. And remember, blessing someone means to convey happiness upon or prosperity. And so he is saying, I will bless you, Lord. I'll praise you and I will make you happy as long as I live in your name. I will lift up my hands and lifting up our hands. It expresses dependence on it's like a little child who raises their hand to their parent. It is surrendering. It is saying, I know that you can pick me up. 
pick me up, daddy. You know, it's like surrendering your life to him, lifting your hands. And that's what it means. That's what we do when we sing worship. It's not just this, you know, I'm going to lift my hands because everyone else is lifting their hands. We're lifting our hands and surrender and saying all of these words that I am singing right now in worship, Lord, I believe them with my whole heart. And I am allowing you to come in and do a work in my heart as I worship you. So it's not like our arms are crossed and we're clenching and we're holding on to our <laughs> to our independence. It's saying, no, my dependence is on you, Lord. Verse five, my soul will be satisfied as with fat and rich food and my mouth will praise you with joyful lips. When I remember you upon my bed and meditate on you in the watches of the night. So meditate here, meaning to speak about the things of God or to fill one's mind with the knowledge of God. So sometimes... God might wake you up in the middle of the night and you're not going to be able to go back to sleep. It could be him trying to speak to you. So allow that to be a moment of meditation. You'll be amazed that most times you'll be able to fall back to sleep if you do indeed meditate, which is kicking out all the thoughts and the worries of whatever's going on and just concentrating on maybe a word that you received, thinking about what it means, praying, whatever it is, but being uh, in fellowship with him in that time for you have been my help. And in the shadow of your wings, I will sing for joy. Okay. So here's another meaning of the shadow of the wings this. So while the other meaning was all about protection, this one could possibly actually mean being in the shadow of his presence, which is a picture of the wings of the cherubim, which stood outside of the Holy of Holies. So, this was likely what they were talking about was, and in your presence, I will sing for joy. My soul clings to you. Your right hand upholds me. So this word cling here also was clave, um, which means to follow hard after. So when you're kind of like running behind somebody really close to them, you're trying to close the gap, no space in between them. So it means to be close to you. My soul is close to you. Your right hand upholds me. But those who seek to destroy my life shall go down into the depths of the earth. Of course, he knows, but in God's timing, because he's not going to do it on his own. They shall be given over to the power of the sword. They shall be a portion for jackals. And jackals were like scavengers. So he is basically saying God will have his justice and his vengeance. And this, I am saying, is going to be the end of my enemies. Here, Psalm 63 Look at all of the things that were listed that David said he would do to or for the Lord. He was going to earnestly seek him. He thirsts for him. He faints for him. He looks upon him, beholds him, blesses him, praises him, satisfied because of him. He will meditate on his words. He will cling to him, rejoice in him, exalt his name forever. Isn't that amazing? Like just in these short 10 verses here, a few lines, we get all of that, all the things that we too should be like David. Whew. While David was on this emotional roller coaster of lamenting and then praising and lamenting and then praising, at the end of the day, his faith was so strong and his writing of the Psalms simply did that, was strengthening his faith as he wrote down the words, as he proclaimed the goodness of God, as he asked the questions. Writing things down is so powerful and thankfully for us, we get to be the recipients of this. We get to read it. We get to get it down deep in our soul to the point that we understand that just like David knew that he would be king, but he was trusting God in the perfect timing of that, we too who can believe in the promise that God has placed on our lives and trust that he will bring it to pass. We won't have to manipulate anything. We won't have to try to force anything. He will do what he says when he believes it is the right time to do it. Our faith is strengthened through David's words by saying that God is trustworthy. He is praiseworthy and we can put our stakes down in that alone. But if you're still struggling with that because you feel like the odds are stacked against you, because you feel like people are coming against you, trust in the fact that God will bring justice. He is not going to allow the righteous to continue to be beaten down and he won't allow the evil to persist because he is a righteous God. He is a good God. He is the light of the world where there is light 
darkness has to flee. There is no way that if you turn the light on in your spirit, that darkness can remain. So we thank you, Lord, that you are the light of the world. We thank you that you and your presence and your glory illuminates the darkness that might be coming against us, that might be within us, that might be in our minds, that might be weighing us down because we're tired, we're defeated, we're sick. Oh Lord, I just pray that we will cling to you the way that David did. I pray that you will strengthen our faith today, every single person. Lord, whatever their need is, God, you know it. You knew us before we were ever in our mother's womb. And Lord, we know that your plan and what you are doing is all for good because we love you and we take delight in you, Lord. So we are trusting that you will give us the desires of our hearts, that you will transform us, that you will renew us, that you will conform us into the likeness of your image. So I pray for that today, Lord, as we surrender ourselves to you, as we lift our hands to you and surrender and say, have your way, oh God. We are so grateful for this time. We're so grateful for this community. We are so grateful for your word and for your Holy Spirit that sits with us every day as we read your word, as we sharpen our swords, as we get ready for the day ahead, Lord. I pray that you will fill us up, fill us afresh, oh God, so that when people start poking at us, Lord, it will only leave a little hole, a little bit might drain out, but we trust that when we come back to you once again, Lord, you will fill us back up again. So thank you for meeting us here in this space. We love you so much in Jesus name, amen. Heaven is a divine gift to us that is given by grace. We're not going to get it because we are indeed righteous. We are getting it because God loves us. But again, we will not receive that promised land. We will not receive that gift of eternal life if we don't receive Jesus. So I wanna give someone that opportunity today who is saying, I've never done that. I've never given my life to Christ. I don't know where I'm going to go after I die, but I see now that that is real and I want to believe. So if that is you, we're going to say a prayer. I'm going to put the words on the screen so you can say them audibly with your mouth because the Bible says that when you believe and when you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, that he died and he rose again, then you will be saved. So let's pray this prayer, believe it in your heart, speak it with your mouth, and know that this is indeed the day of your salvation. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for Jesus. Jesus, thank you for dying for me. I believe that you came, you died, and you rose again. I thank you that all of my sins are forgiven. I confess of my sin, I turn from them, and I live my life for you. So I receive you now as Lord and Savior of my life. I belong to you, Jesus. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.